say one quick thing um, about our school district. Um, Grassroots America has teamed up with some of our friends in North China, and we formed a coalition called No More Excuses Tyler ISD because our district is not where it needs to be. And in fact, 19 out of 25 campuses, 19 have declining academic results. And I'll say one of the most heartbreaking things I've seen since I've lived in Tyler the last 20 years is that one of our North Tyler schools, and in Tyler, Texas, that's the minority schools. Jones Elementary was a blue ribbon school. Blue ribbon school for years. So we all came together in Tyler after some reforms and I supported building two rounds of new elementary schools. Some of that debt Peggy's been talking about. Because I believe the district was ready to do the right thing. So I turn around and I start today looking into what the academic results are in those new schools. And it's more than unacceptable. We just can't live with it. That's why we're opposing the bond election. Because we have too many children trapped in schools that are not educating them. Amen. And I'm going to tell you, I told the Tyler Chamber, some of their committees this last week. I asked them, I said, I invite you, if you have never looked at the TEA, Texas Education Agency website, and you've never looked at the comptroller's website to look at the results of these schools versus the dollars being spent per child. In some of the schools with the worst results are the schools that get the most funding. Folks, something is drastically wrong in a community that sits by and lets this happen and there is the sound of crickets from people who ought to know better. And I told that chamber group, I knew they were going to endorse the bond election. I knew it when I went there. But you know what? Somebody's got to stand up and say it's not acceptable. Amen. And I'm going to tell you what I'd like to see. I'd like to see in House Bill 2980 and Senate Bill 1775, I'd like to see some of our North Tyler children set free to go to school at Jack Elementary. Yeah. Yeah. And some of the South Tyler schools where they actually are teaching children, they have better academic standards. I'm going to tell you, there's something wrong in our community when we are okay in our predominantly minority schools when they are sitting there as Jones Elementary used to be a blue ribbon school and now it's a one and a half star school out of five. It's not acceptable to me, and I'm telling you, the people in this town that want to shun us because we're standing up, that is A-OK -okay with me. Because you know what? I can wake up tomorrow, Doc, <laughs> and look at myself in the mirror and say, you know what? At least you tried. But we're going to stick with our friends over here, and I want to say thank you to Pastor Battles, and to Mr. Cedric Granberry and to Mr. Granberry's father for being here because these are men of courage. And I hope that they will meet uh, Katrina and Reverend Tatum today and share your life stories. So I'm going to quit preaching and ask the question. But she's good at it. I thought she'd go past the plate. She needs to. We should. <laughs> Good idea. Okay. Let's pass a bill. All right. First question. <laughs> How do current charter schools replicate? Do they make additional campuses at the same level or expand up, like expanding from elementary to middle school, a uh, center? Uh, the, the, the rules, are we good? The rules are we good? One, two, three, four, four five. There, there you go. go. Uh, the, the rule is, and I could be slightly off this, I'm doing it from memory. 
to replicate without approval from the commissioner again, because it's a long process. It takes about a year to a year and a half to be approved for applications like that thing. You have to be have finance, strong financial background as well as a plan academically. Uh, but if you're, if 75% of your schools are in the top two levels of our ratings uh, for three years, then we let you, uh, and if you don't have any school, it's unacceptable. So again, I may be off just a touch on that, but that's a, a little bit on that, but that's the general. So you really have to demonstrate that you've done a great job. And, and one thing I do want to just add to that, because again, we have some, what happened, see, the first charter schools in America came in in the 90s. Texas, the first one was 95, and they, and they set the cap at 215 then, which it is today, we're raising it to 305. And unfortunately, the legislature granted over 100 charters in like a year. Nobody, they didn't, they didn't have the system set up. You know, it's like this star testing that we're working on that we're going to reduce way down uh, because we have too many tests. It just, it just, it was a bad model, and we, and these are the failures we've been stuck with it for 10 years or longer. So, so now it's a very, very high bar. But what I was going to say is, we, we, we talked about, we focused on our failing schools. I, I do want to, we need to acknowledge that. Many of our schools are great public schools, and most of our schools are doing a good job. And sometimes teachers or superintendents get upset. Well, you know, you're running down education. All of that, I'm not. I'm trying to lift up public education, but I'm trying to get them to acknowledge just because we criticize the weakest links doesn't mind me for criticizing you if you're doing the job. You know, you have to, before you can solve a problem, you have to acknowledge you have one. You know, there are 330,000 teachers in Texas. You know, if just 10% of them aren't on the job, that's 30,000. Need to go do something else. It's like legislators. Trust me, there are some that need to go do something else. There's always a problem 10%. Thank you. What is the difference between regular public schools and the public school charter schools? I found that the charter in 2000, by 2004, through political subterfuge, I ended up not holding on to the charter in San Marcos. Back then when we started charters, the, 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 the benefit was the reg regulations from the state were minimum. You were able to be as creative as possible. And there are still some creative opportunities. But the only difference I see is you don't have as many rules. You still have the same accountability system. You have to take the same test you're actually having to do the same or more with less. And charter schools in many cases are performing um, at or better than many of our schools. KIPP Academy has done a tremendous job of replicating its program across the state and country. A lot of it has to do with your business model. And let me just say this, whether it's charters, vouchers, or whatever, the bottom line is money. We are saying, give more people access to the educational dollar in an effort to produce better results and not continue to allow the monopoly of public education to dictate what is best for the Texans in our communities. That's the bottom line. If you listen to the anti-expansion uh, or anti-access group, um, the first thing out they'll tell you is it takes money away from public schools. The second thing they'll tell you, it, it hurts public schools. Well, guess what? If you're not performing, African Americans, black males, been one all my life. 83% of black males will be placed outside of the classroom for some kind of alleged disciplinary action. Two-thirds are ill-prepared for life outside of high school, and there is no record of academic success in those core courses. Folks, this is not politics for us. Our babies are dying, for real. And for our leadership to play games with our babies is damnable. And we need courageous people 
whether they're black or white or brown, rural or urban or suburban, and you can't forget the suburban fear. There's a suburban fear that if you give these kids hope and opportunity, that they're going to infiltrate these private schools out in these beautiful hills, of, these piney hills of Eden. No, guess what? We personally, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, we want to identify a thousand churches that are really willing to start a school and let them have access to the six or seventy-five hundred dollars to start schools in their churches where we got started in the beginning when they wouldn't let us in public schools. <laughs> We need, and, and our philosophy is, rear our own to succeed. We know what our kids need. We know what's happening. And guess what? Whether it's charter or public, most of the teachers and administrators in these schools do not live in our neighborhood. They take those same dollars and go out to the suburban or rural communities where the taxes are smaller. So, ladies and gentlemen, we feel your pain. We want you to feel our pain and not allow those who are controlling the monopoly to use subterfuge and division and even the term racism. You're beginning to hear that to keep some of you from coming over. Guess what? What they're doing is bigotry, or as Bush used to say, the soft bigotry of low expectations because they don't believe the babies can get better and they don't believe the parents know what's in their best interest. And my friend, where that comes, where I come from, that's called slavery. So that's the difference. Whether it's charter, whether it's any of these bills that Senator um, Patrick has put up, yes, 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 and more yes. Don't get caught up in the details. Get caught up with increasing access and opportunity. And when you start taking those dollars away, Sister Joanne. I promise you they'll start changing their ways because guess what? They're starting to call their schools schools of choice. They're taking our language. We're not taking our philosophies and our principles to be able to help all babies rise above the status quo. Thank you. Katrina, we talk about failing schools and declining results. Why are we not addressing these directly and replace the leadership in these districts? Nothing changes if nothing changes. Well, that's a really good question. I think in your opening, you mentioned most people who want to talk about education or complain, rather, about education don't even know who their school board member is, who their trustee member is. And so it's we need education on all levels, including ourselves, who are engaged in this fight. Um, like the Reverend mentioned, some of the fears that are being put out there. We, as the individual, are not even educated on some of these topics. And if they're using our language, um, that tells you that we are sort of touching a nerve somewhere. Um, but with regards to you know the, the superintendents, we don't get to pick them. Um, you have a school board. Many people don't go to their school board meetings. But what's more interesting than that as Senator Patrick mentioned, the number of school teachers. Um, Texas ISDs are the largest employer, third largest or fifth largest in the world. China, Walmart, Texas is right there. Their, their school districts are the largest employer, which is probably why so much money goes to them. So we have to start looking at it like a business, like an enterprise, and, and do hold these districts accountable. And the only way we can do that is to put these sorts of measures and grading systems in place. I mean, what is exemplary? What if I, what if exemplary, if I knew what that meant, wasn't good enough for my child? I should probably figure that out. So putting these forms in place is, is going to be the first step at taking control of the situation because the people of Texas have no control over the situation. Not just because they don't have control over their school boards, but because we have let our legislators sort of take the lead on the topic and not listen to their constituency. Let me give you an example. Something that's going on, let's just use Dallas for an example. Garland ISD pulled my son out. I sacrificed the last three years of his time at home, sent him off to his dad's out in Wiley. Because I refused 
to let him go to any high school in the city of Garland. What they are doing to our children today is they've created a new revenue stream for the city. If your kid uses a curse word, you get a ticket. Along with that ticket comes a fine. You gotta take time out of your day, take your kid to court, see the judge, get issued community service, pay a fine, and go about your way. Maybe you have to take a class, depending on how bad the word was. Take two days out of your schedule to go to this class with your kid for saying a bad word. And that costs money too. It's not a free class. So you have these underprivileged minority children trapped in an education system, which is now a new revenue stream for the city. But let me tell you, true story, two fifth grade students, basketball teammates, on the playground during recess, throwing acorns at each other. Does any of that strike you as odd or bad? Well, guess what? These kids got written up and cited for assault with a whip. So they are already giving these children quote unquote criminal records before they even get into junior high. That's the school system we're talking about in the inner cities. That's what we're talking about is why we have to hold accountability. And to, to Royce West credit, he actually addressed this in a bill. I think it's in a bill 408. He wants to hold school districts accountable because they're giving out these tickets like candy. And I think that's great. The problem is that they're giving these tickets out like candy to begin with. We shouldn't be making new laws to plug holes in the system. The whole system needs to be completely dismantled and rebuilt with the appropriate intentions for children in mind. So Joanne, the answer is we as parents, we as taxpayers need to get educated on how the school system works on the local level, take them over so that we can fight it on the state level. Thank you. So Peggy, exactly what is the difference between a charter school and a regular public school? I thought we answered that. I, I think the key difference is for parents, the fact that they get to choose that school. I think that's really the key. I think the whole debate that we're talking about is such an old system that we are using in public schools. Again. Where else would we allow government to assign kids to schools based on their zip code, assigning them to government schools? I think it, just to say it sounds, it makes my skin crawl to think that that's what we're accustomed to doing, that's what we've always done, but we don't have to. There are so many other education opportunities, charter schools simply being a choice where parents can choose to send their children to that school if there's space, and right now, those charter schools are filled, and we have 101,000 kids whose parents are waiting for them to get a chance for that choice, and that simply isn't acceptable. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to, uh, I tell you, Peggy, this may be one for you as well. I'm trying to combine some questions because the crowd wants to talk about C scope, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna get to them. Yes. Yes. All right. Um, but this one is uh, one more on charter schools. Uh, Peggy, could you address the concerns? Well, first of all, who determines uh, which districts actually, who can get a charter school? Address that first. Well, that's been determined by the State Board of Education, but the new bill will make it the Commissioner of Education with the state, elected State Board of Education having veto authority. Am I right, Senator? If currently the system is the TEA does 90% of all the work because the State Board of Education, you know, they don't have to get reimbursed mileage when they go to meetings. Um, and uh, sure. we have some great people in the State Board of Education. They meet about six times a year for three days. They're volunteer. They don't have, a, they don't have staff. They don't have anything. So <laughs> currently the role is the TEA uh, does all the work sends over the application to SBOE, the SBOE sets up some interviews and they make the final decision. And there's a new accountability system to approve charters. 
Uh, first of all, we've never had training for the TEA or the SBOE, so we're going to have the National Association of Authorizers. There are best practices for approving charters nationally. Everyone's going to have to be trained. Remember, so we don't want some bad actors slipping through the nets. Look for things that are red flags. Number two, the TA will continue to do exactly what they're doing now, but there'll be an interim step before the SBOE. The commissioner will approve or disapprove. Any schools that the commissioner approves, the final decision is with the State Board of Education, up or down. And uh, my former district director and campaign manager, a uh, lady named Donna Bohorich, who took uh, a lady, Terry Leo, who stepped down, she's the actual uh, chairman of the subcommittee on charter so she's brilliant. We'll do, do a great job. Before you go, I just want to say one thing about choice. I want you to think about something. A superintendent said to me, Dan, if I lose a student to a private school, it cost me money because when that student leaves, because they get funded based on what we call the average ADA, average daily attendance. And then we had something called WADA, which is the weighted average daily attendance. So a special needs student would receive more than a non-special needs student, for example. There are different needs and adjustments. And so they said, you know, if I lose a student, I lose my average daily attendance. I said, well, I have a question for you. Should we pass a law that no one can move out of the state of Texas? And, they looked at it. and I said, because, based on what you said, if little Johnny's father gets transferred to North Carolina, you just lost his money, didn't you? Well, yes. I said, so should we ban kids from moving? And that's how idiotic it is. And then, and he said, yeah, but this is a private school. So well, let me ask you another question. If little Johnny's parents can afford to send him to private school or grandparents, is that okay? Well, yeah. I said, so, so it doesn't make any difference if, who's paying the bill. If I'm paying the bill for a poor child, does that change the dynamic? No, it's, the whole argument is just crazy. Just crazy. Okay, uh, one more about uh, charter schools, and, and maybe Senator, you could address this then. Um, how many of the charter schools are the Turkish Gulen schools? And, and address uh, where we are in addressing the concerns about the, the people who uh, hold those charters if they're American citizens or not. You know, there's a, there's a wonderful thing about technology. And by the way, if you're not on my Facebook page, please go to my Facebook page. Um, I think we have more than any other legislator because I do it all myself every day or almost every day. It's, it's facebook.com, dan.patrick.texas. And I say that, or at Dan Patrick on Twitter, I say that because I'm a real technology guy. So I love the internet, and I learn lots of things, and I get a lot of information like Cisco that came from parents, grassroots, and teachers. But sometimes they're just things on the internet that are just not real, and you don't know the difference. And so I've seen all of the issues. First of all, I've seen emails go out, well, any new charter should have all these rules about the citizenship and the board all. It's already in the law. You've got to have this, Senator Patrick, or, or else I'm against the bill. It's already in the law, number one. Number two, um, I had a question about the Army School because I, you know, I, I read things and I listen to things. And this is all I can tell you is Harmony has now about 24,000 students in their schools. They get about 300 applications a day because they're noted for math and science. And I, and I can, this is the only thing I know. I've not had one parent in my district. And now that I'm chairman of education, I get input from all over the state. People who didn't know me before now know me. I've not gotten one letter or one phone call from one parent of the 24,000 in the schools that's ever said their students are being indoctrinated in anything. I just, I mean, I just, it's just, I've never had a phone call, never had a letter, never had a complaint. What we do get are parents raving over the fact that it's the best math and science of their students, or some of the best math and science. So if there are issues out there, like Cisco, it usually bubbles up from the grassroots. There's no, there's no way I know what's going on in a thousand school districts and 8,500 campuses. So uh, I just, that's my answer. And, and if they're like Cisco, I believe in tackling a problem head on. So we've tackled that problem. And, uh, and we're going to continue to tackle it. But I just haven't, no one's presented me with a problem except emails so far. There have been a lot of articles written, there have been questions, but nothing has bubbled up yet. But, but we are vigilant on that issue. Okay, uh, now we're going to get into Cisco. So you all trade off and chime in on answering these questions. Uh, what is the status of the investigation of Cisco, Senator Patrick? 
I'm sorry, I, I, want, I want a general question, so I guess it goes back to me. Uh, I first started learning about the problem with C-Scope, and like, again, go back to the internet, I'm thinking, did they really have a lesson that said the Tea Party patriots were terrorists? Is that internet that's really true? Well, I tracked it down, it was true. Did they really have a lesson that talked this much on Islam and that much on Christianity or Buddhism? Really true. Did they really have a lesson for sixth graders to design a flag for a new country that was a communist country, so they had to design a communist flag? It was true. But more than that, I was concerned about how the structure was set up. I was concerned about a lack of transparency. I was concerned about a lack of openness. So I conducted, it was the first hearing we held. And the other members of the committee, I think, were thinking, okay, now we've got this Tea Party conservative term of education. Where are we going now? By the end of that hearing, let's just say, let's just say, not only were they convinced, but about three weeks ago, we passed the bill out nine to nothing, or nine to little committee, <laughs> to put C-Scope under SBOE because they were shocked. I mean, there were contracts that said if you're a school teacher and you reveal anything to a parent, you could go to jail. Wow. And every time we brought up something to the, to the C-Scope board, they'd said, well, we've taken that off the website. We've changed that. And let me tell you what C-Scope is real quick. In rural districts, we have, we have regional service centers in Texas. The state's been divided into 20 regions, and each region has a service center. Now, there are a lot of people who don't think we should have any. Some people support them. But in rural Texas, they tend to be more popular because what a regional service does is provide service to school and school districts. So in smaller school, and, and you have to remember, we have, again, it's all actually close to 1,100 school districts. 65% of all students go to only 97 school districts. The, the average school district in Texas is less than 2,000 students. I mean, they're very, we have a lot of school districts that are under 500 students. So they're very small, and they don't have an IT department. So they have a computer issue, they need help. They don't have an HR department. They, you know, so they may not have a curriculum manager. So what C-Scope did was, uh, it comes out of the 20 regional service centers, and I forget what C-Scope stands for, I can't remember the acronym, but it doesn't stand for anything. <laughs> it's not worth anything, so there we go. And, and so they started providing, they started out as, as a management tool for a new teacher so that you knew where you should be in the third week of what you should be teaching in the fifth. So by the end of the year, you're where, you're, where the State Board of Education says you're supposed to be. That's okay. But then they started opening up into these lesson plans. And they take lesson plans online, and they testify, no checks and balances, they had no idea what... We asked about the communist life, we don't know about that lesson. Every year, you know, it's always, you know, we don't know, we don't know. And so out of that hearing, I, I got them to agree to close down their private corporation. I got them to agree to put their lessons online. I got them to agree to a number of things. Well, I'm not so sure they've agreed. I got an email two nights ago, dated April 3rd, that the Decatur district, which is up in the Dallas area, is it not? The Decatur superintendent wanted to charge a parent $515 to get copies of the lesson plans. And in the email to the parent, the superintendent of Decatur said, I need to check with Cisco to see if I can give this to you. So they're already, in my view, and I've sent this out to other senators. They say they're complying, but I don't think they're complying. So I like, I just think they need to be out of the lesson plan business, period. That's where I'm going to keep pushing. But until then, we're going to put them under control with SBOE. They have 1,600 lesson plans we have to review. Can you imagine, how many lesson plans do you think they have in social studies for kindergarten and first grade? How many could you possibly have? 82. Just for kindergarten and first grade. And I don't know what's in it. So, so we're, we're, we're on that, we're on that issue. Uh, Robert Taylor. Let me just add a bit to Senator Patrick's comments. I've had the privilege of serving on the Regional Service Center in Austin when we founded our charter school back in 2000. Um, I was asked to serve as the first charter school representative on uh, the regional service center and they didn't want charter school representatives on the board and when they allowed us on the board they did not want us to have a vote on the board so i was just there but i was glad i was there because it gave me an opportunity to see the inner workings of those regional service centers up close and in person and i must say uh to my chagrins we thought it run more like a for-profit enterprise 
that was simply focused on making a dollar than it was on doing what was in the best interest of those districts and those children to produce better outcomes. And we talked about this in 2003, 2004. So this is just um, an example of how they have used billions of dollars historically to use for their private enterprises. And when I brought this up to Senator Superior, Superior back then, they heard me, but the next thing I knew I was off the committee, off the board. <laughs> So I didn't get to finish my third term. Oh, by the way, they had us um, have to be reappointed each year. So there was no continuity. And it's it's a system, folks. It's all a system. This When I first heard about Cisco, I said, like, it's the chicken, uh, what is it, the rooster coming home, uh, the chickens coming home to roost? They've been operating out of this way for years and years and years. And they go in when it's convenient and utilize the state system and then they come out when it's economically feasible for them to and not have to adhere to what Senator and some of the others has been questioning them on. So I appreciate this effort, but until we get a handle on those regional service centers, that mentality is going to continue to spin the districts out of control because many of them are refusing to move. We call them the educational mafia back in the day. <laughs> Because some districts don't want to use their services at times, but because of the pressure and how the system is set up, it forces them into uh, embracing things such as this curriculum uh, that many of us don't think is in the best interest. So that's my two cents. It's a mentality of well, the system. Thank you. I will give you a success story with Cisco here. Um, so it's not all doom and gloom. As I said, I pulled my son out of Garland Independent School District to put him in Wiley Independent School District. Then I found out that Garland didn't have Cisco, but Wiley did. So I went from one extreme into the other. Um, but I will tell you that the first thing we did, being who I am, we set up a meeting and brought in a, someone that had been gone across the state and speaking about Cisco and invited all the parents from Garland, Wiley, and the surrounding cities, and needless to say, that night, a coalition of parents was formed. Uh, putting a lot of pressure on the Wiley School District, the superintendent had two parent meetings, gave us the whole presentation, how it began, and why, or how they used CSCO. So, leaving this two-hour meeting to, you know, a 30-second roundup is now, what we've been able to do as parents is working with the school district. We can go up to the school anytime we want, we can log into the computer system and review every single lesson plan that our children are going to see. He went a step further because there were a lot of parents concerned because of the truths that you speak of. So now on the Wiley Independent School District, they're going to post the lesson plans that week online. So if you can't go up to the school and log into the computer and review your child's lesson plans, they'll do that. You can't access the tests, but you will be able to see what your child is learning. The good thing that Wiley has done with these contracts for teachers, they did not block their teachers from reviewing the content of the lessons. Their teachers were giving access in the summer so that they could actually look and see the lesson plans prior to school starting. Most cases you hear the horror stories about teachers getting the lesson plan that night and then having to teach it the next day, which I agree is extremely ridiculous. The teachers in Wiley do not have that. They have freedom and access to the system. Parents now have freedom and access to the system. And they're also putting it on the website for parents to go and check out at any moment, at any time. Now, I wouldn't suggest that you have every single superintendent call the Wiley superintendent. Uh, but I do think that that is a model that we could get behind until this mess is picked up. And when I first, uh, when I was named chair of education in the fall, I went around the state to meet as many superintendents as I could. And I really, I like to listen and say you learn. And much, much of what's in these bills, I mean, the superintendents like a lot of our bills, teachers like a lot of our, not 100%, didn't expect them to, but like my wife said, you have to make them all happy. That's not my goal. My goal is to focus on the kids, what's the best environment for the kids. But I had a lot of superintendents tell me, I'd ask them about C-Scope, and they'd say, Dan, I would never use it for a lesson plan. Never. We just use it to keep our teachers on course on what they're to be teaching. But there are a lot of superintendents out there who testify. They never read the contracts. They don't know what's in lesson plans. And, uh, and so some of the superintendents, like in Wiley, obviously are doing it right, and others are not doing it right. And they need to be held accountable. Yes. Um, I just 
like to add a comment to that. I think many of us are also concerned that CISCO uses the Common Core curriculum model. And um, just, I uh, just know, raise your hand, Lori. Lori, with On Point Broadcasting, is going to work with me, and we are going to be live broadcasting a tweet fest on Tuesday at noon Texas time to talk about Common Core. I actually did a conference call with our activists in Pennsylvania because they're concerned about what's going on in Texas with CSCO and how it relates to Common Core, which they are trying to fight in their state. You know, I do believe CSCO is the most controversial issue in the state that most people under the pink dome at the Capitol know nothing about, and we are working to change that. So we do have an action item on our Americans for Prosperity Texas website, afptx.org. We have had more people take action on that CISCO action item than any other one of the, I think, nine action items that we have this legislative session. So it's an enormous issue. I really believe that Senator Patrick has given the leadership that is needed to call the public attention to this issue. Back to the question we were initially asked, I think also that Attorney General Abbott is investigating CISCO. I know some investigative reporters are doing the same. I anticipate we will be hearing a lot more about following the money and how CISCO has been more about money for these region service centers and less and less about educating the kids. It is indoctrination. We have great concern about what's in the lesson plan, but we have also great concern about the lack of transparency and following that money. Peggy, I would expect then that after General Abbott finishes his investigation would be, that would be the juncture at which we could look for ways to um, either eliminate the regional service centers. In other words, we will have grounds to do so, or there will be political grounds to do so. Okay. We might just add, excuse me, that um, the region service centers are up for sunset. This is a regular process that the legislative uh, uh, session that the legislature takes to review agencies and um, public entities to see whether they're useful, are they running efficiently, are they working well, what are the recommendations then that might be given to the legislature that they might enact that next session. I will tell you, we will be fighting to eliminate the region service centers. They have betrayed the public trust. <laughs> Texas Region Service Centers do that the private sector can't provide. And big school districts, why should we have every single school district having to purchase lesson plans? That is an absolute waste of our money. And let's face it, Cisco doesn't sell lesson plans, they rent them to you. You pay per year, per child, and no matter what you've changed or what you didn't like about it the year before, you buy that same substandard material that next year you rent it per pupil. So we'll be working to eliminate them. And the Texas School Board did a study of all the C Scope schools. They're in 875 schools, districts. And the, the school overall, schools that use the C Scope lesson plan, their students perform at a lower grade on the STAR test in school districts that didn't use. And yet we had when we had testimony in our bill last week, I had superintendent after superintendent come up. Rah, rah, we love C-Scope, rah, they brought all their customers in, it really aggravated me. In fact, one superintendent went back up and they gave him a high five back there because he really challenged us, basically to get out of his life. You know? I'm in his life, um, <laughs> and, uh, and I'm not going away. Talk about the one that said that he vetted C-Scope. You, you shut him down. Because, yeah, he, he, he hadn't even read the contract. He didn't, he, didn't, he didn't know what was in anything. And I said, Are, aren't you concerned that the lesson plans teaching basic math and science are incorrect in your classroom? Well, everyone makes mistakes. So we, <laughs> no, you know, those, those kind of mistakes. Lesson plans, you know, two and two out of nine doesn't work. <laughs> Not that that was it, but, but and, and, the, and the last one, so you know this, C-Scope is not under control of anyone. It's outside the State Board of Education, it's outside the legislature, it's outside the commissioner. The commissioner has authority over the regional service centers, but not authority over their products and programs. Well, I just added an amendment to our sunset bill uh, on Thursday, where our big 
education bill, I added an amendment that will give the commissioner authority over the products and services so he can close them down. Now, I need to get that amendment passed. Two party supporters. I need to get that amendment passed uh, in the Senate, get it done in the, in the House. And then the commissioner can give him pay attention because he might close it down. Uh, Peggy, this one is for you. What is the best way to get people informed about C-Scope so that they can uh, inform your district? You know, uh, actually, Joanne and I were in a meeting. Can we talk about this? Yes. We were in a meeting last weekend. No secrets, really. The Tea Party leaders from across the state came together to talk about C-Scope, to recognize that C-Scope is one of the most important issues. Let's face it, what goes into our schools today is how our government is going to look tomorrow, right? And so um, the Tea Party leaders have agreed to take C-Scope on as an issue. I actually have a conference call, a strategy conference call with a number of C-Scope activists um, Thursday, Wednesday evening, I think the 17th. And we are talking to folks both inside and outside academia. We are going to come up with an action plan with material Right now, we all know all politics is local. We can't change Washington, D.C. and the debt load there, I tell people, if we can't change our local government debt load. So folks, all of this is local, and I salute Katrina and so many people across the state who have taken action with their own school boards. Some school boards and some superintendents are more, uh, are more easy, are easier to work with than others, are more malleable, more willing to, to listen. But the bottom line is we have to start taking control of our schools. Unless we start running good people for the school board, we are going to continue to lose control of our schools. So there are things that we can do. We're going to be providing better information, both on the transparency front, on the content front, as well as on following that money. But let me just share with you regarding the content, content. I have no confidence that the content that will be reviewed by the State Board of Education and the public reviewers this first cycle on social studies is going to be what has been in our students' classrooms. I believe that is being sanitized as we speak. Right, right. And when parents come to me and show me lesson plans and say, I complained about this, and they changed it immediately. I said, and what makes you think they did not change it back the moment you walked out of their office? This can't be something that can be changed at the whim as if there is someone behind the curtain making these decisions and, uh, and we simply uh, can't step back and allow that to happen. We have to take control. I, I have absolutely no confidence in the region service centers. I will say that again. They have betrayed our public trust, and we must move forward uh, uh, eliminating them and taking control. Guys, I had to sit down on the job. The old girl's back at church. Okay, uh, Peggy, uh, probably maybe you, you've done so much work on this. If, if C-Scope is not under anyone's official control, how did, it, how did Texas schools get it anyway? You know, here, I, I will first say, I'm no friend to most superintendents, and, um, and yet, <laughs> I wear that banner proudly, that's probably the truth, thank you. But I do believe that many of them bought this product with confidence because they have had trust in the region service centers. I believe that's where the region service centers let us all down. Because so many, I've had, I've had school board members call me and say, Peggy, I just want you to know we have C-Scope in our district. We had no idea what we were purchasing. We had no idea what content was in there. And now we're stuck with it because that's the, the curriculum that we are using. Now, remind, remind you, at first the region service center said it's not curriculum because curriculum is supposed to be approved through the State Board of Education. And then, they, then, you know, of course, Senate Bill 6 last session said that online material could circumvent the, uh, or didn't have to be approved by the State Board of Education, as our textbooks are, because we use permanent school funds for those. And if you want to use the permanent school funds, you have to use an adopted textbook. Well, I think that was well-intentioned when it was passed, but it gave them this circumvention. 
However, they've been in our school, school since 2006. I'm sure they fought to get that circumvention, so they have a little more legitimacy. But, um, but I think the bottom line is that many superintendents probably didn't even know what they were buying. But now, they are too hard-headed to even admit that they made a mistake and to see some of them come before the committee and say to people like Chairman Patrick, I fully vetted it and I'm confident it's the best product for our schools. When the schools are not doing better under C-Scope, when so many errors have just been pointed out by SBOE Chairwoman Barbara Cargill, for someone to sit there was so ludicrous and, and so hypocritical to say, I fully vetted it. When clearly they either didn't fully vetted it, vet it or they don't give a rat's ass what's in the kids' school. Okay, I don't know who wants to take this, uh, but the question is, doesn't Project Share accomplish much of what Cisco claims to do even if it's only meant for rural ISDs, and after all, it's free. Does anybody <laughs> want to comment on Project Share? Um, if I understand correctly, I'm no expert on this, but I believe that the legislature provided an opportunity for small school districts to band together to share resources, whether it be purchasing, administrative, other resources such that they don't each have to duplicate the same thing in their school districts. I think it is in place. Uh, frankly, let's face it, I think uh, we have so many school districts, it makes sense that they should be consolidating some of those services, but maybe we have too many school districts. Horrors for me to say that. I am a, a graduate of Odessa Permian, Friday Night Lights, Mojo Mighty Panthers. We love our football. We here in Texas love our football, but folks, there's a way to preserve our football, but still make sure that kids get a quality education and that we don't have to have one non-teacher for every teacher in our schools today. That we don't have to continue to spend 50 cents out of each education dollar on something other than instruction, the major purpose of our schools. So um, whether it's Project Share or any other, I think that there should be an opportunity, perhaps a renewed effort, and let me tell you, I don't think this is going to happen unless there is school choice, unless school districts are forced to change their ways. Right now, they are fat and happy. They are demanding more money and getting it. And they have absolutely no incentive to be more efficient. And we need to force that. Should we do more? I have any more questions? But I just don't want to keep people too long. So. No, no, we've got, we've got probably another 15 okay. minutes. Okay. Um, is the Texas Association of School Administrators, or TASA, part of the regional service centers that promote Cisco? Oh, I'll take that one. <laughs> Only because the Texas Association of School Boards and the Texas Association of School Administrators have absolutely waged war against me because I've waged war against them. Folks, these are folks who take our tax dollars from our school districts and then what do they do? They fight what parents want in our schools. So um, the Texas Association of School Administrators has nothing to do with education region service centers, though they may very well be promoting some of that material. I will tell you that I just got a PowerPoint presentation that one of the Cisco school district superintendents had given at the spring TASA uh, conference. And in that presentation, she said that they needed to be more proactive in voter registration, among other things. Now folks, if that doesn't send a chill up your spine and make you angry, I don't know what should. Because they have absolutely no business in voter registration or in anything to do with elections. So, um, and again, we're going to be releasing this. I forget the name of the school district, or I would tell you, but I want to say, there's one of the superintendents that has a presentation out slamming all of us who are opposing C-Scope. And right now, C-Scope and the Region Service Centers are sending material around to the C-Scope school districts how to defend C-Scope, how to deal with parents and the public who, um, who come in to oppose CSCO. 
They have an enormous PR campaign. Their website's changed. Their material on their website has changed. They are ready for battle, but folks, we are too. Okay, um, this is a question about the access to Cisco. So, Senator Patrick, in your mind, where are we on parents and people that are not on uh, school district payrolls? What access is it your understanding that we should have today? Well, according to the agreement that I um, got them to sign back in February, uh, they were to put all of the lesson plans online. Uh, they needed, they said, some time because the lesson plans have the test answers embedded in the lesson plan, which I understand that makes sense. If, you're, if you want a child to pass the test, then you have to teach them at some point the answer to the question so they can pass. So they had to take the answers out um, of the test. Uh, they told me that it had been done. And so, again, they had 1,600 lesson plans, and now they're downloading these lessons online. And they did a big press announcement this week and they had them all online. However, I'm now getting feedback from parents that say, no, they just have samples online. And further, this Decatur superintendent said, well, he had to check with Cisco to see if he could make it available. And this is why I think we need to shut down the program. I don't, I think, I think they have um, been less than uh, a lack of candor. Uh, in terms of what they've agreed to do and following up. They're totally, totally mismanaged. They have no management structure whatsoever. Uh, it, it, it was an embarrassment their first day that they testified. Just an embarrassment. They, they didn't have a clue what they were doing. You know, how, I, I mean, not a clue. The first question I asked when they formed this private corporation, and that's what they were hiding behind. Every time a parent asked for something, they would, and, and the parents were sending open letter, open records requests in Cisco, and it went to the Attorney General. And Cisco's answer was always, well, we have this private nonprofit that we set up, and so therefore, we act like any other company, but we, for proprietary reasons, we need to keep our lessons. But that, well, wait a minute, publishers publish textbooks, they're private companies, that's why you can see, so why are these, why are these secret? So the first question I asked them, because you can't be a public entity and form a private corporation with tax dollars unless we give permission. There are exceptions. <laughs> For example, um, the general land office wanted permission to form a nonprofit, the Alamo, to help raise funds. So the legislature approved that, but they couldn't do it on their own. So my first question to them was, who gave you permission to form this private company? Uh, did you ask your legislator? No. Did you ask the attorney general? No. Who told you to do it? Well, our attorney. Do you have a written opinion on that? No. So they're closing that down. And I said, so, and, and I held up the letter that they sent to the attorney general. I said, it says in this letter right here, I remember it like it was yesterday. It says in this letter, you operate like any other private company. In tech. It says, is that what, the, is that what you also against? That's what we said. I said, well, tell, let me ask you a question. You all have an address? Your private company? No. Do you have a phone number? No. Do you have any employees? No. Do you have a bank account? No. Does any money flow through or out of this nonprofit? No. I said, I don't know of any private company. You talk about every private company operates like this. It doesn't have an address, a phone number, an employee, or a bank account. That's a shell corporation meant to hide what you're doing. And that's why they ought to be closed down. I just can't get enough people to agree with me in the legislature yet, but I'm not giving up. So we're doing the best we can now because we sent all these lessons to the SBOE. The SBOE, I believe, is going to find so many mistakes and eventually legislators who are protecting them you know, will eventually cry uncle and say, okay, damn, I got it. Yeah, we need to close it down. We, we need to close this. Down, besides the amendment for the commission. It's just a mess. It's, it's, it's a mess. Okay, if C scope is rented every year, why can't the districts just stop renting it? Well, they can. They absolutely can. But just as Senator Patrick said, some of these superintendents will even sit before the legislative committee after hearing 
person after person testify on biases and errors and omissions in this material, and they will sit there and defend it. It is absolutely indefensible. And frankly, a lot of those superintendents ought to be given that pink slip and a boot Amen. out the door just by virtue of it. One of the other things is it's not just an annual fee. These school districts pay monthly fees. These are monthly services. This is access monthly. So let's just say they said, okay, we're not going to pay you anymore. Well, then guess what? You've lost your lesson plans for the remainder of the year. So that's why this is sort of a work in progress, because in order to maintain access to the internet-based program, you have to pay the fee. So until this situation can get worked out, or the legislature can do something about it quickly, um, maybe something that can be developed over the summer, so that school districts have something to put in place for the, the next year, because that's essentially the problem. These lessons, you lose access to the lesson plans, and your teachers have not spent all summer working on lesson plans. They're now codependent on the system to function for the remainder of the year. But these are only some of the school districts in Texas. The big school districts have curriculums. Curriculums are out there. There is not, it's not like there is no alternative to Cisco. They are everywhere. Why are we as taxpayers paying for it time and time and time again? Why can't smaller school districts use the curriculum that has been developed by some of the larger school districts? We all pay for it. Again, it goes back to the notion that they're operating a governmental enterprise as if it's a for-profit enterprise, and they're not looking for what's in the best interest of the state or the people. They're looking for what's in the best interest of them making money, because otherwise, they would. Act. I'm getting some feedback. Otherwise. We would understand now with the internet and the ability to put material out there for free that you could get textbooks online on a DVD or disc. You can get all of these things online free of charge. Oh, we've already paid for them once. They're just coming back and paying for them and making money off of them again without looking at what's in the best interest of the kids. Imagine when they set up this quote-unquote enterprise. They knew exactly what they were doing and it's not the first time. When I sat on the board, that's exactly why I knew that they were working outside of the best interest of the kids in Texas. They were working on what was in the best interest of their economic power. Now, ma'am and sir, please, I'm not talking about an individual. I'm talking about a system that continues to fail us all. When you talk about individuals, they take it personal and they think you're talking, you know, in, in the larger scheme of things. So let's not talk about individuals because same mess, different address. Almost 1,200 public schools, you'll see it happening all over. When there's free money that you feel you're entitled to, you're gonna do what you think is in your best interest. But when you start holding them accountable and talk about better results, then all of a sudden they demonize the pages of the world. That's all she's asked. If we're gonna spend $36 billion every two years on educating five million kids, we at least ought to get 55, 60% better results, at least. But when you have 650,000 African-American students and two thirds of them are ill-prepared after high school, guess what? That's $120,000 per kid with no accountability and no one asking for better results. And instead of looking to see why we are producing the worst results in the history of our country, even doing slavery and Jim Crow, they want to call you racist and they want to call us people that don't care about our own communities. Well, my friend, I'm like Peggy, and forgive me, I'm Baptist, but to hell with them all, because that's exactly where they're going if they continue to let our babies die on the vine. And I, we need you, every one of you, we need you. But one of our biggest challenges, and I can share this, is we're not organized well enough around the issue of educational freedom. We're not funded well enough around the issue of educational freedom. Sister Peggy and some others have been in this a lot longer than me. I came in in 93, 92, 93. They've been fighting this battle a long time. 
And I had to put the intellectual thought process on this to understand why is it that there's so much resistance from the very people who say they represent me. I'm talking black legislatures. Why are they fighting this so much when those of us who are pastors and are in communities, who have to go to school meetings with parents, who kids are getting kicked out of school for a little bit of nothing, who've been sent to juvenile justice centers for a little bit of nothing, and then their parents are being forced to pay goop gob sums to try to get their kids either out of the criminal justice system or in another school that's gonna give them an opportunity. To hell with it, because we're losing babies while they're talking about making money. And when we took a bus, two buses from Fort Worth, another van from San Antonio, and there was one supposed to be out of Tyler. But guess what happened to the bus out of Tyler? One of our good friends in Austin called the president of Jarvis Christian College and counseled the students from Jarvis coming down to let you know they get public funds for college. Why can't our babies in K-12 get it? Y'all, and I'm gonna close with this. The reason I wanted to come to Tyler was in 1965 at the beginning of the year, the man who impregnated my father told her to have an abortion. She refused to have an abortion and she took her babies. We were poor. Took all of us and went west to Fort Worth. Found an abandoned house. We lived in an abandoned house my first, before when my mom was pregnant with me. I was born premature with jaundice, and the doctor gave up on me on day one. After six days in an incubator, they finally took me to my mom on Christmas Day. I lived in poverty my whole life. The way I got out is I had big hands and could catch a football, and I ran pretty fast. But when I recognized that I got out and the other nine were left back, God said to me, it's your responsibility to go back and open up access for them. Whether it's in Tyler, Fort Worth, Dallas, or Odessa Permit, our kids are producing the worst outcomes of any children in public schools. The state of Texas has come to the conclusion that when everything is in common, the number one factor that is causing the worst outcomes are the institutional racism within public schools. Folks, we need out. Not tomorrow, not in the future. People like my mama, who they said because she was poor, we lived in housing projects and everything, we didn't deserve the same opportunities. Walk by private schools who were doing a great job with a bunch of kids, could only marvel at the idea of going to a private school. But headed to an elementary school where the teacher says, you're nothing, you're never gonna be nothing because of your place of zip code and where you come from. Folks, this is real. This is really real. And we need more feet and we need more finance. Because this past week in Senator, uh, Senator Patrick's uh, hearing, we brought all of these superheroes, the mothers and fathers, some on canes. The oldest man was 92 years old. He said, I voted Democrat my whole life. But if they don't vote for school choice, I'll never vote for them again. This is real. We need your help. Don't allow the naysayers or the doubters to cause you to pause. We need you to be supportive of Peggy. We need you to be supportive of Senator Patrick. We need you to be supportive if the Tea Party is pushing this issue, then support the Tea Party. We have some ministers for education and we're hoping to get more ministers because they understand it up close and personal. And you know what they're looking for? Options, access to their same money that's going outside. So thank you all. Tanya and I, we drove down, we're gonna drive back, gotta preach in the morning on this stuff. 